This video is going to be about poetic devices in the epic poem Beowulf. In ancient times, when Beowulf was first written, poetry actually had a public function to entertain people. Now you might think, what do you mean entertain people? But think about how old you've learned that Beowulf is. No one had video games or TV or phones or movies or anything like that, or even books. People could not read or write. So people used poetry as entertainment. Now this entertainment was done um, according to an agreed upon formula or set of conventions, and that's what we're going to go through in this video. So first off, uh, the method of composition for these poems was often spontaneous. That means without planning. And it was oral performance, so someone singing it or talking in front of someone else. Uh, however, the poet was well prepared for this role. It was usually someone's role in the community to be one of these scopes, one of these poets. The poet had a word hoard, is the, is the term here, of uh, formula phrases that they could use um, reliably so that it wouldn't seem that they were just coming up with stuff off the cuff. Um, they also had a ready supply of folk tales, battle sagas, historic events, and notable leaders, all of which provided them with um, what they could be saying their poem about. The poet also accompanied their recitation with a small harp or a lyre. So um, because this was done in oral tradition, it controlled the length and the arrangement of lines in some of the poetic devices. That's what we're going to go over. Since the epic poem was meant for performance before a leader and followers gathered in a hall, the language demanded the use of certain devices to aid both the teller and the listener. So the devices we're going to go over made it easier for the teller to tell the poem and remember and uh, what they were saying and, and keep in rhythm. And it also made the listening of the poem easier for the listeners as well. So here is one line from Beowulf. And we're going to go over some of the terms that you need to know. So the first term is called a stish. Uh, and then a half line is the hemistish. So you can see that a stish is Grendel, the fiend's name, Grim, infamous. And a hemistish would be the Grendel, the fiend's name, and Grim, infamous would be the other half. So each half line has two stressed syllables and a varying number of unstressed syllables. You can see that we've marked that out here. So Grendel, the fiend's name. So we have Gren and fiend, those are the stressed syllables, and dull, the name, are the unstressed. And then grim and infamous. Grim is stressed and in is stressed as well. So then fame, us, is the, are the unstressed syllables. So we can see that each half line has two stressed syllables and then unstressed syllables. Also, you can see that it's kind of broken into two pieces, like I said, the half lines. Um, and that breaking point there, you can see that comes right after name. That's called a sesera, and that's a pause for breath at the midpoint line. Now, remember that everyone is doing this out loud for performance, so they're going to need to be able to take a breath. Uh, in addition to all of this, there's also alliteration. Now, alliteration is the close and purposeful repetition of beginning consonant sounds. So you can see that we have Grendel and Grimm, both beginning with G. Now, the reason they have this alliteration is that, um, just like we've said before, it helps the, the scope remember what they are saying, and it helps the listeners um, figure out where they are as well. So we have Grendel and Grimm, and you can see that those are... Um, in, in this type of poetry, the alliteration always comes on the stressed syllables as well. So for example, I wouldn't have alliteration um, where that the was or the name. And you can see they didn't do that. So we have stish, hemistish, sushera, and alliteration. Those are all the things that you need to remember. Another uh, Another poetic device that they would use is called a kenning. Now a kenning is a condensed metaphor. So instead of having a very long sentence or sometimes you can have metaphors that go on for a whole entire story, kennings are condensed metaphors that are usually only two words that are hyphenated together. 
So for example, we have the Kenning blood sweat. Now, what could that mean? Well, blood sweat is actually blood um, from battle. You see, it's like sweat running off of you in battle. Another Kenning here would be battle light. Battle light, can you guess what that means? That means sword, because your sword is something that brings you glory and saves you in battle, so it's like your light. So try to guess the last one, glory reaper. What do you think glory reaper is a metaphor for? What do you think the Kenning means? If you guessed hero, then you're correct. A glory reaper would someone would be someone like a hero who reaps lots of glory, who gathers lots of glory. So these are the things that you need to remember about poetic devices in Beowulf. First off, uh, all these were done for entertainment. They were done spontaneously, but the people who sang them had some preparation. Uh, a stitch or a stitch is um, a whole line and a hemi is uh, the half line. Each half line has two stressed syllables and then unstressed syllables. A sessura was that pause that allowed someone to take a breath after a half line. Alliteration, which, oops, is spelled wrong here. Alliteration would be done. Um, it's the repetition of beginning sounds on those stressed syllables. And kennings were the um, short metaphors.